Yes, you're in, you're in perfect order and we'll, we'll do introductions. So following the protocol, um, just a, a brief intro, a description of a thought of some sort. You know, talk about your companies and, and uh, you can even react on what you've heard the past few days. Let's start with Tim. Great. Hi, I'm Tim Tuttle. I'm the CEO of, of Expect Labs, and we have a product called MindMeld, which uh, helps our customers to create really great voice-driven interfaces for their applications and devices. Uh, our specialty really is to take our customers' large content collections, whether it's a movie catalog, a product catalog, a database, an FAQ um, data set, and turn that into a really great voice-driven and natural language-driven intelligent assistant for content discovery, for customer support, and many other applications. That's my background. Uh, Andy Morrow from Nuance Communications. Um, uh, my team invented Nina back in 2012, deployed it with Jeff from USA over there um, a few years ago. And since then, uh, after running the R&D team that did that, uh, ran a product team as we sort of scaled some of that business. And now I run, as it relates to this panel, uh, a team called the Cognitive Innovation Group at Nuance. So we've sort of come to the realization, we created this team about a year and a half ago, that artificial intelligence is sort of the future of intelligent assistance. Intelligent assistants are the delivery vehicle for uh, what is gonna be the real battleground and where the real innovation comes from, which is going to be on the space of AI. So we've heard a lot about reasoning and inference and other techniques, learning from humans, I think that's a big one. Um, and so really our team is focused on bringing that to life in partnership with, that's why I sort of said we've got science bridging industry, that's what we're doing here in, in my team, which is pulling stuff out of our research lab, uh, partnering with industry, and then most importantly, working in situ with our customers to bring these innovations to life so that this isn't stuff that's just uh, us stuck in the lab. So uh, that's me. Hi, uh, my name is Alan Sabrell. I work with Amtrak. Uh, I work with the e-commerce team, and I manage uh, uh, different business programs for the e-commerce team. One program deals with the Human Emulation Technology Program. We uh, partnered with a company called Next IT a couple years ago to uh, bring this web-based navigation tool to our website. And I led that effort to, um, to deploy that tool. And I'm also supporting um, the maintenance and upgrade of the tool. So I'm glad to be here. So, and, and I'll start with you, Sabrell. Um, the, um, so Julie, uh, has been around, the, the name Julie for, for, a, for an agent has been around for a while. Um, this new one that you've introduced and you, and you uh, characterize it as a human emulation project that you're doing. Um, what new bells and whistles beyond, because I remember the old one was, was you know, getting pretty good at getting people from, you know, making a phone call and <clears throat> booking a train, but what, what, what additional stuff do you see? Well, what we've done is that, keep in mind at Amtrak, we have different um, customer service strategies. Uh, one is agent assistant, where people are using the contact center or station agents. A second one was the VRU, or the voice response unit that was deployed over 10 years ago. And then back in 2012, 2013, we launched the web-based navigation tool, um, and we called it Ask Julie, obviously to leverage the name and the brand recognition. The web-based navigation tool, I mean, it does a lot of different things for us. It assists people with answering questions, um, accomplishing certain tasks, exploring content. And that's important because we get over 200,000 visitors a day that come to our website. And right now through this tool, we're averaging over 20,000 questions per day that have actually been submitted. So uh, some of the new components, I mean, obviously you've got the state-of-the-art user interface where you can enter a question, a phrase, a keyword in a very natural language way. So one is like the input box. Two, um, there's a knowledge base that sits behind it. So we've mapped out our content into um, 18 different topic areas that spawn off into 60 different groups and over 800 not what we call knowledge units. Number three, there's a natural language model. This is important because sometimes when people are asking us questions, um, some ask people ask questions that are grammatically correct, some mm -hmm. ask questions that are not grammatically correct, and the natural language technology helps us with that. And the tool also allows us to capture feedback, and um, it allows us to do things like auto-navigate the pages and also um, populate forms. So the tool is pretty slick, so we sort of come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, we can go, I uh, can't ask the same question, but, but um, does this reflect, in, in your mind, um, Andy, uh, 
sort of a changing concept or recognition of what artificial intelligence is capable of? Well, I mean, to key off of the last point, I mean, this notion of, and I think this is state of the art today, I think this is where most of us in this room are at, is today you're building a, an intelligent assistant using a set of tools, right? Many of us are building language models, right? Often via process of taking input data, labeling it, training a system. And then uh, as it relates to dialogue and knowledge and, and answering questions, are using some sort of structured tool to effectively sketch out some sort of state machine, some sort of dialogue flow or decision tree, link it back to knowledge and back in integrations. That's the state of the art, right? Some may call that AI. I'm fond of going back 20 years and saying if I pulled my Walkman or my Discman out of my pocket and pressed the record button and asked it a question, we would have called that AI. So <laughs> I think that's AI, but I think that's definitely on the softer side of what many of us in this room would get excited about from an artificial intelligence perspective. So if we take that as the state of the art, I think what we're going to see are techniques that move beyond tooling, beyond sort of scripted uh, approaches, programmatic symbolic approaches, right? I mean, the classic uh, struggle between symbolic and statistical approaches in AI, which goes back, you know, 50 years, is still very prevalent. And I think we're going to see, as a result of legitimate real breakthroughs in the space, um, emerging, and this is definitely the nuanced perspective on this, is that it's not one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. And that, what, but what we are going to see is we're all quite strong in the symbolic approaches today, and I think we're gonna see an emergence of statistical approaches based on uh, both learning from knowledge, existing extant knowledge in documents and systems of record. Um, that will not be good enough to build a system out of the box that performs that extremely high accuracy. And then uh, it was encouraging today to hear some thoughts around learning from humans. Um, we've been doing that. We have commercial projects in that space ongoing right now um, to learn from human agents. I think the enterprise space in particular is extremely lucky to have humans in the loop in an organic <laughs> way. I think that is really the key. I, I'm, I, I really do think there will be major breakthroughs in the AI space linked to the enterprise because of the fact that we have naturally occurring humans in the loop in every one of our contact centers, if we can <clears throat> take those statistical approaches to actually learn from uh, the behaviors that are ongoing. So I think uh, we're gonna see a mix of tools and statistical approaches emerge over the next few years. It's um, pretty interesting when he mentioned the human in the loop. Um, we do it, I mean, obviously from two perspectives. On the front end, we give people the ability um, after they've tried to find what they want on themsel themselves to um, escalate to a contact center agent or send an email, so that's on the front end. But on the back end uh, for the human loop process, we uh, review actual conversation flows. So every day when 20,000 people enter a question, like if you were to go and enter a question, I hate Sabrell, I can go look at it <laughs> tomorrow and analyze. So what we do is we review those conversation flows and also we have on our, on our tool an inline survey feedback button so you can actually submit feedback. And we use that back-end process to really set, see how we, um, what opportunities we can develop to refine the content and what are some of the customer pain points. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and Tim, I remember when you first came around and showed MindMeld in, in our office, it, it was the, one of the demos was um, just a video call between two individuals and it was sitting in the background <laughs> making suggestions of, of the, you know, recognizing what the topic was and making suggestions interspersed in that, um, in that conversation. And it was sort of the way of co getting people thinking about what can be done in real time yeah. and, and the role for humans. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's, it, it sounds like what you're doing though has evolved um, quite a bit. Yeah, we're <clears throat> so we started out uh, as a group of AI researchers <clears throat> who are trying to take the uh, the latest state-of-the-art AI machine learning technology and apply it to understanding language with a higher degree of accuracy in real time on broader knowledge domains than what most applications have been built on. And we were able to do that successfully for when we started on a single app. And now what we're focused for the company the past two years has been taking that technology and applying it to the business problems that our customers have. Because the, you know, we, <clears throat> And I know a lot of folks in this room have been in this field for a long time, but um, I mean, just a little perspective on this. The, the state-of-the-art technology five years ago um, really could only apply this type of language understanding to very narrow domains on, uh, you know, using very tight taxonomies. <clears throat> um, uh, and today we can, using products like Siri or Cortana or Google Now, you have 
in some cases, internet scale voice and natural language understanding around very, <clears throat> very broad content domains. And that's a, that's a huge leap in technological capability that I think a lot of folks here wouldn't have been able to envision five years ago. So this trend is only going to continue. And for us, it seems incremental that the changes happen fairly slowly. But um, w I mean, I think we're at the, um, we are at a point right now where there is a dramatic shift in user behavior as well as a, a, in, a huge increase of awareness of companies about how powerful this technology can be. So today, they're, you know, the big search engines are doing 10% of all their search volume is coming, coming from voice. That is, that is a huge deal. Uh, 18 months ago, it was essentially negligible. Mm -hmm. This means that just about every person on the street out there with an iPhone is using voice technology, natural language technology every single day. That's the first time this has happened since the dawn of AI. And people have been talking about it for 50 years. We've seen it in sci-fi movies for, <clears throat> for 50 years. <laughs> it's actually starting to happen. So um, this is a big deal. And, um, and what it's triggering, at least what we're seeing is triggering, is for the first time, there's a large number of organizations that are seeing this change in consumer behavior. And they're saying, oh, I, now I need to have that same functionality, that same ease of use in my own applications. And, it's real. It's, um, you know, I think a lot of companies have done experiments over the past decade or 20 years. I think we're at the point where it's no longer in the experimentation phase. These, mm -hmm. these are not toys anymore. Um, it's not a parlor trick application. These are real applications that provide real value on non-trivial knowledge domains that, um, that can answer a surprisingly broad range of questions. Can I, can I jump in on that quick? Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it, 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 I appreciate the underlining of the fact that everyone in the room is early and we've actually made great strides, but it's sure. actually just the beginning, right? I mean, because I, I, I experienced the same thing. We go talk to executives and when we launched Nina, I mean, we would go out and we had to show demos and show people what this was and remind them there was a thing called Siri. And, you know, it was tough to get people to see what the future is. That doesn't exist anymore, no. right? I have executives tell, I love this anecdote. I had one executive tell me that his son, who he didn't appreciate me calling pre-literate, but he didn't know how to spell yet, so that was the word, right? He said, my son's pre-literate, and his, his interface to the internet is solely via speech, right? I mean, that is a transformative societal effect, because that is the truth for every kid who grows yeah. up now, is their first interaction <laughs> with the internet is now going to be via voice interface because they can't spell. Um, and so that's going to be a big deal. But you're not selling executives anymore on the value of a voice interface or the value of an intelligent assistant. Sure. You're now selling them on, okay, so this gives me business value today, right? I can, in our world, things like Dom at Domino's having real business impact, you know, at USAA and talk to Jeff, they're having real business impact. You know, Martin in the back with Nina Webb at Swedbank having real business impact. Beth, you guys heard talk. I mean, we've got real business results, which is awesome. We love that. But increasingly, the narrative and the story we're having is, where does this fit into my five-year technology roadmap? And how is this going to transform my business? And I will say this. This is an opportunity for everybody in this room who gets this stuff. The question is now, what, what is AI? Yeah. Like, AI is such a big space, and it gets mixed up with the fictional narrative and the doomsday narrative. And so we, where we've been spending a lot of time at Nuance, is in defining what artificial intelligence for customer service means. I've heard some others call it, you know, cognitive customer care. And starting to help people understand what technology disciplines in AI, maybe things like predictive machine learning, you know, maybe things like, okay, deep learning, what does that mean for my business, right? Take it out of the technology and help me understand that. Helping folks understand and define what this means, what AI for whatever your industry is and how it mean, what it means to their customers, what it means to their business, is a huge opportunity, I think, for all of us. And the cool part is, and again, intelligent assistants are going to be the delivery vehicle. So yeah. everyone who's early here gets it, yeah. but we're working our way a little bit from ears and mouth back to brain. Yeah. That's sort of the AI story, I think. And, and executives are hungry for it, in, in my experience, to sort of help us lead them to what that means. Can, can, can I add to that point? Um, as you were speaking about the business value for the customer, right? So we're a client, we use the solution, but what we've done is we've deployed it on the website, right, to help our cu customers. But one of the things that we've done, we understood very early on that 
you know, there's business value for our contact center agents too. So we actually have, the external tool is called um, Ask Julie, but we actually have an internal tool that's called Super Julie. And our contact centers and station agents, whenever a, cu a customer calls in and has a question about a policy or procedure or something like that, they can type it into the Super Julie and see what response that they need to give. So we're providing consistent responses. So that value is actually for the customer as well as internally. So it's really a, really a neat thing. And Super Julie is soon to be syndicated on Netflix. And <laughs> <laughs> prime time. But um, I, I do want to interrupt for a second. You know, you had spoken of it as um, the, the speech interface. But the other thing that, that Sabrell's sort of mentioning is um, People think almost verbally now when they type into Google. We, we've fundamentally changed what we put in the search box in Google by the, uh, the bulk of people who used to, you know, after years of maybe trying to game Google, would just come up with like search terms. <laughs> and they discover, unlike old time search, where the more words you put in, the narrower the response yes. got, <laughs> the more words you put in, the sort of broader and uncertain it got. But, um, now they're asking questions and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like uh, someone will come to our website and they'll say, they'll type in the word pet, that's it. They'll type in the word, they'll say, can I bring my snake on the train? No, we're not the circus, but we'll give you a response. Uh, they'll say animal. So there's many different ways that people express themselves. Right. And they'll ask you a question totally unrelated to travel. What is my favorite sport team? So you have to be able to understand yeah. All of that. <laughs> we don't feel bad. Directory assistance operators used to say that 20% of their calls were just somebody asking what time it is or wanting to talk to somebody because they were lonely. So we'll, that's, we'll that's, have it. That's important. On that one, though, that, that's important. I mean, we've seen on some of our deployed systems that we're absolutely in the early days, I think, like many, you know, when we're early, we were, we're in love with our technology. And so we very much pushed the sort of voice assistant aspect yeah. of this. And even right from the very most early days, users were finding the text aspect to it and using it, which in retrospect seems completely obvious, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I think the notion of intelligent assistance starting to disappear into the channel that mm -hmm. has consumer preference, obviously something like a phone channel, which has been around for a long time, but obviously we all know that web-based uh, customer service and specifically live chat is growing. I mean, the analog between IVR and web chat is, I think, right there. As web chat increases, we're going to need more text-based IAs behind the scenes to automate. That's going to be a, gro a great growth business, but obviously one of the areas that everyone knows is happening but is having a tough time cracking for a number of reasons is mobile messaging, right? That is the sort of lingua franca of our society. That's how we communicate with each other, and so why are we not communicating with companies? And I think probably a bigger discussion and maybe a different panel for another year, but there's all kinds of reasons that that you know that's going to be big, but I think we're going to have to really work our way to that. And so, um, you know, but seeing the the IAs disappear into the background, and I think one of the things that I think we're all seeing is we're blurring the line between: am I talking to a person or am I talking to an intelligent assistant? And you know what, customers, for the most part, obviously there's some exceptions, don't care. What they want is an outcome. What they want is a quick answer to their question or you know a response or an outcome. And whether that, and, and if an automated response can give it to them faster and as accurately as a human, then that's what they care about. And so I think there's a, a little bit of a receding of the IA as persona and sure. personality and, and a blending uh, between the sort of human agent aspect and the, the intelligent assistant. Um, regarding um, whether or not you're talking to an actual person or assistant, there is an excellent a raging debate going on now in the Amtrak because at one point we had a picture on the website, and then recently um, I was instructed to have it taken down, and I fought very hard. I said that, you know, we've got this brand recognition. So uh, through some data, I've shown them how we, the number of questions that we're getting per day is actually going down because I believe that we no longer have that on the web page. But there's this big debate. Some of the executives are like, well, people are getting confused. Are they? they think they're actually talking to a real person. And I'm like, no, um, we say virtual assistant, but so there's a raging debate <laughs> going on. Now. Well, is there an obligation to let people know if they're talking to a machine or a person? I, I think that's a fascinating question. Yeah, that's a good question. There probably yeah. is. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I would think, but yeah. this is uh, <clears throat> this is the wild west, new territory. Yeah, yeah, but. It, what what it speaks to is how how we define success. Because what Sabrell brought up is that. Um, 
rightfully we should measure success at successful resolution of a, of a customer or individual's um, either problem or f completing a task or that sort of thing. Un uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it, it maps to other business objectives like, uh, you know, uh, automated handling. But, but um, you know, what, where do you think we are now? Well, well, like for us, success is obviously, like, did they get their question answered? Okay, just some people just want a question answered. Uh, tell me, you know, Explain your refund policy, okay? So we give you a response, auto-navigate you to a landing page. Some people want to accomplish certain tasks, so they might want to book a trip from New York City down to D.C., and they might want you to help them with that. Um, we also want to reduce um, unnecessary escalation to um, our live agents. Our live agents, we want to um, escalate the calls that are revenue-generating calls, not just, you know, questions such as, you know, what's your children's policy? So. Those are some of our success metrics, really. And then the last thing, I guess, since I'm on this, is that um, we view it as a 24-7 um, usability study. Um, when you get question, you know, 20, 30,000 questions a day submitted, it's like customers are really kind of telling you what's on their mind. So it's like a usability study. I mean, I wouldn't have a lot to add to that. I think that's all, all right. I mean, we all love automation and the ROI and the cost savings associated with that. Um, you know, I think uh, there are a few emerging models, though, just to, so I agree with everything uh, that was just said, for sure. But the other things you might add to that is we often lose sight of the fact that, I mean, momentum, consumer momentum and preference is on our side, right? I mean, another way of talking about automation is instant results, and there's no question that that is. I mean, if you've ever tried, there's a bunch of systems out there you can try now that blend a little bit of human and a little bit of uh, uh, virtual assistant. And the second you end up on that human and you're waiting for somewhere between five to 10 to 12 to 20 minutes, you're going, oh man, right? And so the ones that are interleaved, um, like that, I think you can really feel it. We know it's human when it's a little slow. Exactly, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's pretty funny, right? And so yeah. I think the, the, we're looking, the customer, this is fundamentally a customer satisfaction and loyalty um, building device. And then I think, you know, one of the other things that we're just seeing is, you know, again, at places like Domino's and Jetstar and others uh, in our business is we're actually seeing business results emerging from that that frankly in some cases are somewhat surprising to us, right? When you can order a pizza over 50% faster, it turns out that that actually does help right. uh, build, you know, uh, I won't talk about the specifics, but that actually does help build a business in a more meaningful way. And so um, I think the, the retail aspect to this at, as it blends with the service and support that many of us have started with is actually yeah. pretty interesting. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to make money, uh, not just save money, uh, in this space for sure. So I think <clears throat> 2015 is officially the year where voice is no longer a novelty. So a many companies would put a voice feature or a natural language feature or an intelligent assistant feature in their application as a promotional attribute that they could <clears throat> uh, differentiate their product um, from their competitors. Voice, as of you know, second quarter of 2015, voice is now so widely used by consumers on their smartphones that when we have this conference next year, for many types of applications and businesses, it'll be a requirement. It, is, it will be the price of admission. Sure. Certain classes of users will expect they can press a button and ask a question or type a question. And if you don't have that functionality available in your application for certain industries, certain types of applications, your users will go to your competitors. And so this is a, this is a, uh, a sea change in how this technology is viewed. And it's, and it's happening um, as we speak, mostly driven by the adoption of the consumer voice and natural language products mm -hmm. that are out there. Yet at the same time, like a Domino's is advertising that you can text a pizza emoji <laughs> to some number and, it, and it'll fill your order for you. <laughs> and and uh, so we're, we're kind of bipolar in, in that. And they're both using artificial intelligence when you think about it. Right. And I mean, just to build on what Tim said, because I actually think that's pretty interesting. So I mean, this is more on the consumer side of yeah. our business, but um, I'd be interested to hear what people think. I mean, one of the things we're noticing is, and it goes back again to this idea of initially we were embodying everything, right? It was kind of multimodal interface with sure. lots of screens and lots of stuff. And what we're seeing on the consumer space, right? So in our world, this is um, obviously devices, but also you know connected smart devices in the home and TVs and all that kind of stuff. And then of course automotive. Yes. 
And what's happening is, and this term has been floated around, it's another AI term, right, which is the sort of ambient intelligence idea. And, but it, it's, it's, there's something there, definitely, right, which is it used to be that I picked up Siri and I pressed it and I looked at it and I waited for the microphone, but now hopefully I think I have it turned off. If I say, hey, Siri, here or here, sure. right, I'm waiting. Everything is around me. And so now when I'm at, in my house, I can talk to my device, I can talk to my TV, I can ask it questions, I can get outcomes, and then I walk into my car, and that's just such a great use case because, I mean, there's safety involved in that scenario. Um, you know, I fundamentally believe we're saving lives by adding that technology, but the notion mm -hmm. of being surrounded by an intelligent assistant at all times, I mean, we keep saying, going forward the next few years, IAs are going to be everywhere, sure. but they are going to be much more invisible, right? They're yeah, prevalent, invisible but, they're, but yeah. they're, they're not as seen, right? So uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, evolution. Yeah, it used to be a stigma to have invisible friends all everywhere. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now we'll all aspire to it. I, I know there have to be questions from the audience at, at this point, but over to the right there. This is fun. Hey, thanks much. I'm curious to know if you could, um, uh, specifically for um, Tim and Andy, if you could please talk a little bit about how you see voice and artificial intelligence integrating with augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, mm. So for example, we have ambient computing or the Internet of Things sort of as the inverse of virtual reality. And um, just to kind of follow up on what you just said, how does that stuff go into these virtual worlds as well? First. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the question was, how do, you, how do we see voice search um, interfacing with virtual reality and augmented reality? Uh, well, I, don't, my, I think they're going to blend seamlessly together. I, uh, I mean, s search and interaction is <clears throat> machine learning and natural language driven search is going to blend touch, gesture, um, image recognition, facial recognition all together into, into a single user interface that allows you to interact with your application or device the same way you interact with another person. I think that's, that's the direction that all of this is moving. Um, but may, maybe Andy has some more insight. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny, actually. One of our camera guys, I think Thank Paul, you. I'm not sure if he's around, but he, he works with a company out of Montreal that's actually experiencing a lot of success. They're working with Spielberg and other people. Um, in the you know VR AR space, and I don't. So many of you may have seen a few weeks ago. There was I think a Lucasfilm thing around uh, their AR VR uh, activity at Lucasfilm. Really interesting, transformative stuff. I mean, where are movies going? Kind of stuff. Um, and there's just one really simple observation, which is, uh, and you can think about Facebook too. Maybe Alex can tell us where this is all going, right? <laughs> but I mean, the the there's going to be a couple of things that happen, right? You're initially going to um, be interacting, there's going to be two big use cases probably. One is going to be sort of telepresence, let's all get in a virtual room together. That's clearly the, the Facebook uh, kind of model. I can't wait to get on less planes. Um, and then the other aspect of it is going to be gaming and entertainment, right? Um, when I'm talking to another person, that other person knows how to talk back to me, so I think we're okay there. But as soon as I'm in a virtual world where my hands are my hands and the world is the world, menus don't work so well in that environment. I mean, it's okay maybe if I have to select a bunch of canned text responses with my finger, but I really want to speak. And so I think to the extent that the entire value proposition of virtual reality is immersiveness and that all of the uh, use cases that are going to transform our society and entertainment are related to immersiveness, you're going to need to be able to talk to virtual characters, virtual avatars, the beings that are not real that populate this universe. Uh, speech and natural language is, is the only place. So I see that being another massive market for this. I think that's obvious um, uh, outside of you know, the, the sort of enterprise cases that we're looking at. It may, might not be great news for Amtrak if everybody just <laughs> immerses themselves right. and right. stops speaking. traveling. In that. Yeah. Say if everybody, nobody travels because they're all <laughs> in virtual reality. Yeah. <laughs> Into the holodeck. <laughs> Question over here. I was kind of thinking of this question this morning after um, the, the presentation by Steve from um, Xerox Park. It seems like you know, artificial intelligence um, is becoming more and more pervasive and more and more capable. And then, Andy, you said intelligent assistance will be the delivery mechanism for artificial intelligence. Um, 
So does that kind of mean perhaps that intelligent assistants aren't going to be that important? I mean, you know, the whole conference hmm. is about intelligent assistants, but no, it's really, is it really just going to become a small, you know, delivery mechanism? And is the, the real interesting part all of the, the artificial intelligence that goes on behind it? You know, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's a, and, and, and make no mistake, I'm not trying to, to be diminutive about the IA space. I mean, Nina's my baby. That's, but <laughs> I would say it like this, right? I mean, I don't know how this will come out, but it, it's... IAs are going to be as important as all that we are in this room, right? I mean, having an embodiment of the thing that you're actually communicating with, I mean, otherwise we'd all just be brains in jars communicating, right? And so... Um, <laughs> I do think the embodiment is paramount, right? I think it's quite interesting. I don't know what this means either, but it, it's quite interesting that as a technology, there's not too many instances of a technology sort of emerging, you know, fully formed. We, an IA is, I mean, we talk to it, it's got natural language, it's pretty advanced on, on the sort of surface shell of it, and we are working our way back to the fundamental core technology a little bit, right? I mean, it's not like the internet that started out with really solid plumbing in the 60s, you know, Vince Cerf and those guys building TCP IP, and now we have mobile phones. We sort of started with the end, mm. really sophisticated embodiment of it, which was a thing I can talk to, but to a certain extent, that dream oversold the reality. And now we're, so AI to me is all about making an IA better, more capable. So I think IAs are going to benefit, and this industry is gonna benefit massively from the widespread adoption and and you know the real scientific breakthroughs in AI, um, I think everyone will want. There will be some brain in a cloud activity, you know, analytics and AI breakthroughs that don't have an embodiment. But consumers, in all the scenarios we've talked about, consumer scenarios, enterprise scenarios, entertainment scenarios, are going to interface with this artificial intelligence through an IA. Um, so I think. Uh, I see actually really great things for our industry. I just think we need to actually think of ourselves less as a niche industry, less as IAs alone, and more as the tip of the spear on the artificial intelligence space, which is what I really think we are. Any comments from the rest of our panel? Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, I oh, we have, um, Uh, I have a question. I, you know, I'm sitting here and um, have a lot of background in technology, kind of learning this as I go, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm running into some things that aren't jiving for me. And that is, you talk about AI, but it seems like the conversation, I talked to Alan yesterday, um, I don't think of knowledge bases and knowledge management systems as artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And also, voice recognition and voice response at this point um, have or not, to me, or just the translation engine of voice to some sort of text that allows some action to be performed. So my question is, um, what is in this big ball that we're calling AI? Because it seems like any tech, it seems like anything that has to do with intelligent assistance and the, and the transformation of the industry is being lumped into AI, and I guess I'm having a hard time understanding that. So the, <clears throat> the question was, what is, what is in this big ball of AI? Because uh, from your perspective, it, it seems like there's just a lot of structured data that it sits on top of, and it's unclear where. Is that, am I getting the gist of the question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, my, my view of AI is more of a contextual platform that allows us to read the context of a question that someone's asking and deliver the right a answer. Um, yeah. I don't see it's voice. Re I don't see voice recognition is is necessarily that. Right. I don't necessarily see a knowledge based system as that. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. seems like we're clumping all those things into AI, and I'm just really getting. Conf I'm more confused. I think about what that really <laughs> means than I was when I got here. Okay. Well, I'll take a quick stab at yeah. at this. So the. So I've been um, I've been in AI for a while. I s studied AI as a researcher at MIT and Bell Labs and. Um, and AI changes every, it, it changes every five, ten years, and people have different opinions what it is, and it's, it's a label that's a catch-all that um, means a lot of different things to a lot of people, but you know, the, I would say it for, the, for these types of applications, the intelligent assistant, customer support applications, the, at, the, at the simplest level, there's really not artificial intelligence. It's, it's being able to take 
lots of data, put it in a structured form so that it can then answer questions or serve people sure. or be, respond to que queries to a database. And I, most researchers wouldn't call that AI, but I think the, 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 the advances that have been happened in the past <clears throat> five to 10 years really all about scale. It's about taking those data sets, making them much, much larger to the point where it's not possible to have a human be able to <clears throat> add the structure to those mm -hmm. data sets by themselves, but instead rely on algorithms, machine learning process to automatically learn what that structure is. And so the big advances that have happened recently are all in statistical machine learning and more recently deep learning. And these systems are all ways that algorithms instead of humans can look at massive collections of data and add structure so that you can do things like ask questions and get reasonable answers. And as Andy was saying, this is just, this is the, we're at the, the beginning of, uh, we're just at the beginning of this, <clears throat> this industry because these data sets are only going to get larger and larger and larger, well beyond what any human could conceive of being able to organize themselves. But these machine learning systems will be, get extremely good at extracting patterns, understanding uh, how to add structure, and then ultimately answering questions and accomplishing tasks. Yeah. I mean, so well said. I mean, so knowledge bases are not AI, 100%, right? But there are things emerging, like Tim is talking about, that obviate the need for a classical knowledge base, right? A human going in and curating a knowledge base and then being able to answer a question out of it is precisely the problem that this is going to help solve. The, the ability to take massive amounts of structured and semi, uh, unstructured and semi-structured knowledge and then be able to address that is absolutely part of what we're talking about. It's not the entire picture, but it is part of what we're talking about. So it's beyond the knowledge base. Um, in terms of speech recognition, ASR not being AI, again, this is more just, this becomes philosophy more than anything. You know, 20 years ago, absolutely asking a question to your Walkman would be considered AI back then. Um, it's not today, but interestingly, um, many of the techniques, right? So uh, neural nets that have sort of evolved now to be sort of deep learning based neural nets, um, yeah, all the breakthroughs there, I mean, ASR and image recognition are the two technologies that have benefited the most from the, uh, the advancements in deep learning. So we have deep learning in our speech recognition engines and that's what we're seeing uh, push accuracy into sort of, we've got the last four to five percent of you know, word error rate accuracy on speech recognition. That is a byproduct of deep learning. And if I asked everyone in this room what one hypey term was related to AI breakthroughs right now, we'd probably all say deep learning. So deep learning has, uh, is starting out in the sensory space eyes and sort of, you know, being able to recognize images, uh, usages in radiology and other things. Um, and then uh, ASR, speech recognition accuracy rates are going through the roof. But the breakthroughs in that space are increasingly going up stack. Uh, deep learning for NLP is gonna be a massive area. Um, we're gonna see massive breakthroughs there. Deep learning to drive dialogue systems. Uh, Alex and I were just talking about this. Tim and I were talking about this yesterday. Really fascinating potential breakthroughs in that space. And so, um, the folks that are good at speech recognition are also the folks who are de facto good at things like deep learning and neural nets because that's it really the initial implementation of deep learning was in <laughs> They're the, dusting off their old treatises about it's, neural well, networks for speech recognition. All of the famous now. deep learning guys say, right? I mean, neural nets are cool again. So, um, so you're right, this stuff is, is uh, along one dimension not AI and, and I think along another dimension is the very early stages of the type of AI that is going to transform our industry. Right now, we're applying it to the problems that we have, like speech recognition, like knowledge bases, but increasingly, we're gonna see techniques, and I, we're gonna run out of time, I want, I want to be able to talk a little bit here, but it's <laughs> learning from humans using these techniques is going to be massively transformative. So knowledge bases of curated content is one thing, but I would argue that many of us who you know are close to the contact center realize that a lot of the knowledge is not documented anywhere. It's mm. in our employees' he heads, mm. and every day when they talk to our customers or chat with our customers, they are exposing answers, they are exposing uh, knowledge that they have, and right, I talk to co co our execs all the time and say, your contact center is throwing off machine learning data that you are not capturing, and immediately they go, how do I capture that and what do I do? And so that's one of the areas in our industry that I think is, is again, gonna be transformative. We're all gonna look back five years from now and go, wow, how did all the breakthroughs in AI come from the enterprise space? And it's, again, because of these humans in the loop merged with the sort of uh, scientific techniques Tim is talking about that's gonna allow us to make real breakthroughs. 
So how do we find more execs like Sabrell that bring it into the, the talk sell it to me. Yeah. So you can sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I see an XIT in the front row, I'd be happy to. No, no. <laughs> no it, it, I, I, what you said is so profound, and it, it was part of the, um, well, we'll see it in, when we convene our next Intelligent Assistance Conference, but, um, you know, the, the mailing lists we built were keyed off of customer experience, contact center, yeah. and to get these people in the room and, and, you know, short of, I mean, what you said is, is exactly what I believe, that, that there's this wealth of knowledge coming from this group that feels existentially threatened by the very technologies. It's yeah. sort of like, oh, you're going to suck our brains and replace yeah. us. And, and um, that's the only conclusion I... Can I jump in on that, though? Because yeah. we get asked that all the time, right? Yeah. The labor yeah. arbitrage, uh, doomsday scenarios are often related to, we're going to put people out of work. Yeah. I Which fundamentally is. believe that that is mostly wrong, right? Which is to say, if you sit in a contact center and you watch an agent doing their job, they do two things. They have really massively emotionally resonant experiences where they help customers, right? Insurance scenarios where people have been in accidents, where maybe people have died. These are things that only humans can do and for the very foreseeable future, only humans are gonna be able to do. And that's the reason that a contact center agent wakes up and does their job in the morning. Yeah. And that's meaningful work. But the flip side of it is they also do these horrible, rote, repetitive their... tasks all day, every day, and it prevents them from having those experiences that actually build brand loyalty and, and yeah. value for customers. And so and I really on their own part because turnover I is exactly. Still the and so if we're problem. looking for meaning in what we're doing, yeah. at least on the agent side, like, yeah. like you said, is is that we're actually helping agents do the job they love to do and that is adding value to the company it, by automating the other things. Exactly. And in our case, like we've got these different customer service strategies, agent force response, intelligent assistant. Right. With the agents, if you've got a person calling in that wants to book a trip for 20, a group trip, you need to talk to an agent. Or if a person has a, um, an accessibility issue mm -hmm. and you know they need someone to talk to, I want them to speak to an experienced agent that has that emotional connection, right. not just some machine that's just saying, Can, do you want to bring a wheelchair, do you need this? So it's not to replace agents, it's actually to enhance what they're, right. they're doing. It really is. On that, on that hopeful note for the human race, I think we can adjourn <laughs> for, for lunch and a little sustenance, bad. keep our brains going. And I want to thank this panel because we're exposing a lot of issues. A um, uh, couple things. Um, we, uh, you want to stay to the end because we have a final panel that talks about where all this is going and what the timing might be like, where the gaps are and, and how we continue to serve. Also, during lunch, I just want to repeat that in room three, um, speaking of filling gaps, that, that, uh, that Get Abby and Xerox are convening a group of folks to talk about some of the standards that are needed to get your agent to talk to my agent, my, and, and uh, it, it could get very interesting. And Derek. Well, and, and before we, we go, we want to thank the panel, first of all. Thank oh, you. yes. Thank you, panel. <laughs>